Uh, this talk is about the Kano method, uh, which is a framework for prioritizing product features. Uh, before we jump in, I'm just going to take care of a couple housekeeping things, uh, starting with an introduction. My name is Matt Schron. I lead product management at Livefront. If you're not familiar, uh, Livefront is a digital product studio. We're located right here in Minneapolis. Uh, you may have seen uh, a bunch of members of our team are giving talks today. And otherwise, we're fairly active in the community. So again, really excited to be here and being, uh, you know, participating in this event today. Um, I want to just jump right in. And, and this talk is about a method for prioritizing features, which is a pretty universal challenge, I think, that all product teams face. Um, and as we go through this, I'll definitely get into some mechanics of the Kano method itself. But broader than that, up a level, is just this whole topic of how do we as a product team decide what we ought to build. And if, uh, if you're like me, you've found in your own experience that's usually a pretty straightforward and simple question, right? Maybe not. Um, so, uh, and, and helping me kind of illustrate this is going to be some, some, some AI I generated of animals in various business scenarios. But when your team is planning what products to build, just ask yourself, have you ever found yourself in a room, sequestered, trying to just hash out a debate internally, which oftentimes leads to whoever is just the most effective at arguing gets their way, and then that's what drives the product roadmap? Has anyone ever experienced that? Yeah. Or how about, have you ever sat in a room trying to plan the future of your product, but ultimately it just gets overridden by the highest paid person or most influential person, the infamous hippo effect? Anyone have any experience with that? Or how about uh, you just select whatever feature is the easiest and quickest to market. So it doesn't matter if people want it. It just matters, hey, we can build this and ship it in a week, so why wouldn't we? Sound familiar? Uh, how about your product roadmap is determined by your sales team? Uh, has, has anyone worked in a sales-led organization where product features are basically um, directly correlated with the sales pipeline. So as you're going through this, have you, ever, have you ever just felt like we just have to keep up with the competition? Um, so whatever they're doing, we're going to try to do our own version of the same thing. Sometimes you sit and question and just think to yourself, why are we building this? Sometimes it's while it's in progress. Sometimes it's after it's shipped. Um, has anyone ever had second guesses about the, the, the priorities and the, and the features on their roadmap? So uh, if we kind of step back, different considerations that teams take when planning what features to build. Um, obviously, there's a sales motive, and that, that makes sense, right? After all, like a, a business needs to make money. Um, sometimes it's driven by operational efficiencies, consolidation, things like that. Sometimes it just comes down to an executive mandate. Sometimes it's really a question of technical feasibility. And then sometimes it's, it's cost. If there's opportunities to do things a different way and remove costs from the organization, then it's, then it's worth doing. All of these, on some level, are valid motives. So I, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying these things aren't worth considering. But they're all internal factors. They're all factors that users may or may not give a shit about. Probably not. So looking at external factors, things that are outside the, the room, outside the building, are what do users actually need? Above that, what do they want? What excites them? What delights them? And then, of course, what are competitors doing? If I had to generalize, what, what we see the most often is that internal factors seem to hold the trump card over external factors. Um, and, and generally speaking, product organizations build what makes sense internally without sufficient consultation from the outside world, most notably their users and customers. So 
I'm, I'm here to say today that there are better ways of doing this. One method that I'm gonna walk through is it's what's called the Kano method. Um, it's not an exclusive, like this is the only way to ever prioritize your product roadmap. That's, that's not the message at all. Uh, but my, my hypothesis is that this is a really um, valid and fitting tool to use amongst many for ultimately building that case and helping decide what should we build and why. So what if we could quantify user satisfaction levels for a given feature before we even built it? What if we could analyze those satisfaction levels in a uniform way across multiple features at the same time relative to each other? So, those are some of the problems that, that the Kano method is, is particularly effective at solving for. So, a little bit about the Kano method. Uh, this was a framework um, that uh, um, uh, shot up in Japan in the 1980s uh, by Professor Noriaki Kano. Um, as an old millennial, I happen to believe most good things we have came from the 80s. Um, so, so there's that. Uh, what the Kano method does is it sorts product features into categories based on satisfaction levels as well as functional expectations from users. And I'll go much, much deeper on what exactly that is later. Uh, it's quantitative in nature uh, and involves a structured survey to gauge user response. So there's been a lot of great talks today about um, qualitative forms of user research. And, and, and this is kind of underscoring the point I was making before is none of these methods should have an exclusive. Um, there, there's great ways to talk to small samples of users and customers and get really good signal from that. But you have the, the sample size problem. In exchange for that really rich, rich texture, sometimes you don't know, does the signal we're getting from this study, is it gonna, is it gonna scale? And so Kano is a nice way to kind of blend and, and, and take that qualitative research you're doing and blend it with a quantitative method that helps get at those questions of, did the observations we saw in this small sample, are they, are they, are they persistent across a much larger group? So uh, the key concept of the Kano method is that it's, it's looking at product features through two dimensions or two axes. Uh, the first one is user satisfaction. And, and we'll see this when we actually start looking at some graphs. But plotted on the vertical axis is user satisfaction. So as you go up the vertical axis, user satisfaction increases. As you go down the vertical axis, user satisfaction decreases. So here we can see somewhat of a, of a kind of an opinion scale, but up at the top we've got delighted, and then at the bottom we have frustrated, and a few other conditions in between. Then the second axis, or the second dimension, is the, the functional axis. And that would be represented on the horizontal axis. And, and as you go across the horizontal axis, you have more and more of the feature implemented. So it's faster, it's more performant, it has a bigger catalog. Whatever that is, and what, whatever that kind of linear effect is in your product, um, think of it as the more you implement, the more you invest in that feature, um, the, the, the more kind of robust and, and, and fully functional it is. Um, as you go in the other direction, it's, it's less functional. So it's either not implemented at all, or it's partially implemented, or it's implemented in a kind of an MVP, just bare bones, basic kind of way. So plotting these two axes or dimensions together is kind of where we really get the magic of the Kano method. Um, and so again, here we see, you know, on the vertical axis, it's representing user satisfaction. On the horizontal axis, it's, it's representing, um, uh, you know, functionality or, or the level or depth of the implementation. Um, and then I'll go through what each of these lines represent, but, but essentially what the Kano method tries to do is categorize features based on where they are plotted you know, across those two axes. So uh, to start with, we have performance features. These are features that have a really linear relationship between functionality and satisfaction. 
as you implement more of the feature, satisfaction increases. Um, and so just to try to make that more tangible, um, you know, a lot of times this would be the, the kind of feature that consumers differentiate between products. So if it's a music streaming service, that, that performance feature might be the available catalog. So, you know, X streaming service has, you know, you know, 10 million songs and another streaming service has 5 million. Well, that's, consumers are gonna notice that, they're gonna differentiate based on that. And, and, and so that's a good kind of conceptual example of a, of a performance feature. Um, so, so looking at, you know, Spotify, a lot of people enjoy that, you know, Spotify just basically has like almost anything that's ever been recorded and it's just ubiquitous and at, at your fingertips. So the more that Spotify's song collection grows, the more satisfaction users presumably are. The next category is delight features. And this is different from performance features in that um, they, when these features are available, they, they bring satisfaction, but when they're not available, they don't necessarily dissatisfy. So a lot of you have probably heard the term surprise and delight. That's what this, this category really is. Um, and so, you know, when a new or novel feature um, is introduced, it has this very surprising effect. So, you know, think back um, to when the iPhone was first uh, introduced. Um, everyone was wowed by the touch screen and the display. Nothing had been on the market like it before. Um, but would anyone buy a smartphone that doesn't have a touch screen now? Probably not. So, so a thing to note is that as time goes on, expectations shift, they change. So something that's a delight feature at one point in time necessarily isn't gonna be that way for life. So, um, Going back to Spotify, uh, a good example of a perform or a, oh that's a typo. <laughs> a good example of a of a delight feature would be a personalized playlist. So, you know, you have this My Discover Weekly every week. It just delivers you 40 new algorithmically generated songs that Spotify thinks you're going to like. It's great for discovering new music. You never quite know what you're going to get. It's awesome. That that's a, that's a good delight feature. Okay, the next category is table stakes features. Table stakes are kind of the inverse of delight in that if the, the more that a table stakes feature is implemented, it doesn't necessarily yield incremental satisfaction. So you have this kind of plateauing effect, um, but if those features are present, or, or sorry, absent, they are definitely gonna dissatisfy. So um, the example I always like to give of this is like a password reset. Nobody would write a five-star review for an app because like, they have an amazing password reset experience. But if you lost your password and you couldn't sign into the app and you couldn't, and, and you couldn't reset your password, there was no support for password reset, it, it's one star all the way. Like You would be pissed. Um, so uh, the thing with table stakes is you can only, inv or you should only invest in them so much because after a certain point, they're, they're not gonna yield any additional satisfaction. So uh, in the Spotify example, the, 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 the one I came up with was, was search. If you couldn't search for songs um, in Spotify, it, it, you would think of it as this is not complete. Like, you know, th this, this, this product is missing something pretty fundamental. Uh, more clues of old millennial status there. <laughs> Um, the, the last category is indifferent features, and these are the features where there is no real meaningful relationship between um, satisfaction and functionality. So, you know, as you, as you uh, continue to invest in these features, they just don't yield any satisfaction. Users just frankly don't, don't care about them. Um, in a Spotify example, this would be like, I don't know if anyone ever launches the, Spot, the Spotify app to go and read about like their famous or uh, favorite artists, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's there, um, but, but it, it doesn't really dramatically impact a given user's satisfaction of the product overall. So that's the concept of Kano. Let's start getting further into like how this actually happens. So um, 
how do we how do we go from having an unprioritized you know roadmap of features to getting real signal on where these features might fall into those categories we just walked through. So um, to do this, let's use a hypothetical product. Today is Earth Day, um, so 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 let's 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 use a mobile app that you can use to order plants through. Let's call it Plant Parenthood. Um, so to to start categorizing these features, we've got kind of two opposing questions. There's the functional version of the question. Uh, and so you're asking if you could, and I, I just made up a feature here, if you could take a quiz to help find the plant that's best suited for your home, how would that make you feel? The inverse of that question is the dysfunctional question. If you could not take a quiz to help find the plant best suited for your home, how would that make you feel? And so the Kano method in the survey, and we'll, we'll get further into this, is by combining those two questions and by examining the relationship between the responses for both as a set, then you get a feel for, okay, if the feature is there, what does it do for satisfaction? If the feature is not there, what does it do for satisfaction? And then through that combination, that's, that's ultimately what drives features into these different categories that we talked about. So, um, you remember we, we looked at that, that um, satisfaction scale earlier. Uh, as you can imagine, in, in administering a Kano survey, the available responses are uniform across the entire survey. Um, and there's, there's lots of different variations for how exactly to ask or, or to, to, to present like these possible responses. But you're basically asking your respondent to report on if this feature were available, how, what would your reaction be, ranging from I would love it to I would hate it. And conversely, if this feature were not available, how would you react on that same scale? So if we put this all together and, 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 it, and you know, kind of visualize what it would look like in an actual survey, so we're asking the question, if I could take a quiz to help the plant best suited for my home, it always helps to have some kind of tangible rendering of what that feature could look like, even if it's abstract and conceptual. Uh, and then we're presenting the participant with these available options. I would love it, I would expect it, I would be indifferent, I could live with it, or I would hate it. Then, if we look at the dysfunctional version of that same question, if I could not take a quiz to help find the plant best suited for my home, uh, and then I've got the same available set of responses. And the split between those is kind of where the real meaning lies. So, let's look at what this actually looks like when you put out a survey written in this method and then get your response data back. Um, so, looking at that, that same example, uh, if I could take a quiz to help find the plant best suited for my home. So this is before we're plotting, you know, um, th this is just plotting in a bar chart form, satisfaction against dissatisfaction. So for that plant quiz, we got kind of a tepid response here. We're not really seeing a whole lot of opportunity for increased satisfaction. And, and similarly on the dissatisfaction or the dysfunctional side, it's just kind of a muted response. So there's, there's just not a whole lot going on here. Um, and so you might categorize this feature of the plant quiz as an indifferent feature. If we implemented it, it doesn't appear that it's really gonna dramatically improve the user experience. If we looked at a different feature, um, and this is one we haven't looked at, but just um, if every order or if, if every order I placed came with free express shipping, what would that do for satisfaction? So we asked that same set of questions, but for the different feature of express shipping with every order. And here we see something very different. The average, the average satisfaction score is much higher and uh, inverse to that, the, the average dissatisfaction score is much lower. So a much more intense kind of response. Um, what, what this response data set is telling us is that um, if this feature were available, it really would yield meaningful satisfaction across our customers. And, and if it weren't, uh, perhaps they would feel like they're missing out on something that maybe they get from our competitors. So these are just two hypothetical examples, but you can see if you're testing you know, eight, nine, 10 features, 
you really can start to see how they, how they stack up against each other. So this is blown out to if we you know, ran that kind of same question pair for a bunch of different features. So Apple Pay, loyalty, we've got our plant quiz, if we had a money back guarantee, express shipping, if you could keep your own personal plant log, if you had a social profile on our property, if there was a virtual assistant or a plant AR kind of visualization tool so you can see you know, how the Monstera is gonna look in your front entryway. Um, the, the, uh, so, so you can see where you've got some pretty dramatic swings and separation between these features. So ultimately, this is an input, a useful input for seeing, okay, how, how intensely do users respond to, to these different features? If you plot them a different way in a scatter plot, um, you know, we can see, so we've, where we have satisfaction on the, the vertical axis and dissatisfaction on the horizontal axis, then we can start to put them into those Kano categories. So, so, you know, over to the right and up is our performance features. The more we implement, the more we support, we see a really proportional uh, increase in satisfaction. Um, you know, in this case, we didn't have any table stakes features, but, um, you know, in the, in the lower right quadrant, uh, those would be features that users just expect. Um, we had a quite, in this particular sample, we had a bunch of indifferent features. So it doesn't matter if we implement it or not, it's just not gonna move the needle on satisfaction. And then in this sample, we didn't have any delight features either. Um, and so where your planned or considered feature set falls into these categories, it's dependent on a lot of things, like how mature your product is, how novel some of these features are, what your competitors are doing. It also, frankly, it, 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 there's a lot to do with how they're presented in the survey too. Um, but what, what I think is particularly useful is seeing how they stack up relative to each other. Okay, so that's the basic constructs of how Kano works. Um, we <coughs> we've run a bunch of these kind of studies and along the way kind of picked up some tips and tricks. Um, and so I wanna share a couple of those with you right now. So the first kind of category is really in the planning stage of it. And th there's a lot, that, there, a lot of thought that should go into what features are we ultimately gonna test with this Kano method. Um, you, you want a certain level of investment scale to be there. So you know, if it's just like a small, simple feature that can be implemented in a couple days, like who cares? what you're really trying to do with this is those big kind of direction setting features that are gonna require a pretty significant investment, whether that be measured by in financial terms or opportunity costs or whatever it is. Uh, also, um, you know, just one really common scenario for where Kano works well is if you're planning a brand new product. So we, 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 we have a motive to bring this new product to market we don't know yet exactly what feature set it should have. Um, we're considering a dozen features at the same time. Kana was a really good and efficient way of kind of cutting through that and helping us make sense of a, a pretty long list, knowing that for our initial release, our MVP, we might not be able to build all 12 of these for, for that first, first release. Um, another place where Kano plays well, I think, is when you know, your product is supported on multiple platforms and you're evolved enough to know that we shouldn't just assume like platform parity. So like just because we have a given feature in our web product doesn't necessarily mean we need it in our mobile app and vice versa. Um, and so when you're trying to really think through what do users expect on the mobile form factor and what do they expect like on our web product, uh, Kano can be a really effective way to get to those answers as well. Um, one thing also is b the surveys are dense. They're not exactly like the most natural kind of, kind of questions. And because every single feature you want has at least two questions paired with it. Um, so if you have 12 features you're trying to test, bare minimum, you've got a 24 question survey and it's just intuitive that as you add more and more questions, you know, um, question fatigue becomes a real thing, and then people just don't either, they, they just 
abandon the survey and don't complete it, or um, they, you know, they just start going through the motions and, and, and not really giving you a thoughtful, earnest answer. So try to keep it as, as small as you can. And I, I, I don't think there's any scenario where it makes sense to test more than 12 features at, at a time, and ideally even less than that. Okay, um, there's also something to be considered about whether or not we should actually have some aspect of the feature designed before we run one of these Kano surveys. Um, you absolutely can run a Kano survey before you have designs. And sometimes, as a practical matter, you don't have a choice. Maybe you don't have a design resource available on your team. You can still you know, try to describe the best, the, the, the feature the best you can with text and you can still get a good response. However, I think it always helps um, to, to represent some conceptual rendering uh, of, of what that feature is for a few reasons. One is um, you put less pressure on yourself for perfectly wording these questions because it's not a super intuitive kind of question and it's easy to get the, the wording wrong. So by having a visual, it's just a reinforcement to really convey what you mean or what you're intending the user to respond to. Also, when you don't have that tangible representation of what the feature is, people tend to fall back to their mental model of like whatever a plant selection quiz is, and you're gonna get a lot, and you can either get all of your sample responding to the same stimuli, or everyone's responding to whatever their own kind of preconception of what a given feature is. So, so I think it helps to, to actually represent design. Um, one thing I would say that with that though is to practice restraint. The downside of putting a design in your Kano survey is that people can then overfit for certain like visual elements. So if you have just some like really like aggressive like you know visual pattern or, or you're presenting like the entire feature at the same time instead of just really drilling in on the specific interaction or feature that you want to test, um, you, you know, you, you're, you're just gonna contaminate your results because people might be responding to, you know, the illustration style and not the actual feature itself. Um, so yeah, further to that is really to just isolate the thing you're truly trying to test and don't present any other, other kind of surrounding aspects of the product. Um, there's also just how do we word our Kano survey questions? So it's, it's not, easy to write these, these questions. Um, you have to use, <coughs> excuse me, you have to use as plain a language as possible. Um, try to avoid technical jargon as much as you can. And then also this isn't, you're not trying to sell people on your product idea. You're trying to get their honest, unfiltered um, response. So it's important to, to, to adequately describe what the functionality is so they really understand it, but without adding kind of value judgments within that. Um, so this, this definitely isn't like a, you know, a marketing exercise. It's a, it's a research one. Um, also, we've played around with the wording of the response set. And as time has gone on, we've gotten more and more polarized. Um, if someone listened to that last sentence, there's a lot of <laughs> interpretation with that. But, um, but by like really making the responses polar. So at the top of the scale is, I would love it if it had this feature. And then at the bottom is, I would hate it. And then filling in in between. Um, we found that because more than likely, the person taking this survey has never taken one quite like it before. Um, so it's a good like signal for them of, of you know, that's what this scale is, is representing. Um, and so we found better response. And also even just, I, I'd put these emojis in there, not just to be cute, but like in the actual survey, we put the emojis to kind of reinforce like the emotional condition um, of the respondent as they consider each question. Okay, a couple survey delivery tips. Um, there's there's a, a lot to be said about the sample that, that you're actually gonna test with. Um, and you might not always have access to like large volumes of consumers or whoever you're trying to ultimately uh, reach. But just as a general rule, I would say you, you want at least 100 responses. Um, and then beyond that, you should really align your kind of sampling strategy to what your product strategy is. So if you think there's a meaningful difference between consumers that prefer one platform over the other, 
then account for that in your, in your test plan, in your sample strategy. Um, if there's meaningful differences in demographics or geographic regions, account for that. Make sure you sample people from all the groups you want to see represented. Um, if there's certain behavioral traits that matter, the most frequent or the most common one would just be how frequently do people use our product. Um, make sure you have that in, in your sampling plan as well. Okay. Um, what if you don't have well-defined user segments going into the test? That, that's, you know, you may, like sometimes you can directly tie it into your CRM and you know exactly who you're delivering the survey to and you've got their product usage data and you can m match it all up and it's great. But not everybody has access to that. So what happens if the people that are responding to our survey, we don't know anything about them? Well, you can use the survey to kind of build in your own profile or segmentation. Um, so, you know, before you actually get into the heart of the Kano questions, ask those profile questions that you think might be useful later on. So, for instance, if you want to see if whether or not a, a respondent has experience using your competitor's product, ask that. And then you can see those cross tabs and, and split out the results between the two. Um, if you don't know how frequently the respondent uses your own product, it's not the best, but you can still ask them and use that kind of self-reported usage as a signal to see, okay, do, do responses and attitudes change uh, amongst users that are really frequent users of our product versus really infrequent users? Um, and then platform modality preferences. So if, you know, ask, um, you know, when you're doing this or that task, do you typically do it on the web, um, mobile web, native mobile, um, you know, whatever it might be. Okay, um, I'm not gonna tell you that these questions aren't a little awkward, um, and it's easy to get them wrong. So how can we be sure that we're asking the questions in the right way? So one thing that's helpful is to just, and you, you don't wanna reveal too much about what the method is and what you're trying to do, but if, but if you at least if explained that opinion scale and those two hypothetical scenarios of if you had the feature, if you didn't, that can be, <coughs> <coughs> excuse me, really helpful up front, just so people have, a, have an understanding of, of, of what each question is intended to, to do. Um, another thing that is invaluable is to test the test before you send it out to a few thousand consumers. Um, you know, ask somebody like in your office or in your own network who has no priors of what you're doing, ask them to look at your survey and, and get feedback from it. Or send it out to a small sample of 25 or 50 people and, and just make sure that the test is intuitive and, and worded um, uh, precisely enough before you send it out to the masses. Um, another thing that can be interesting to do is <coughs> sometimes if you, let, let's say that you're, you, you wanna really drill into and test like six features. Um, it can be useful to just add a few extra kind of outlier features in there just to make sure that, you know, like, and what I mean by that is like adding a feature that obviously would satisfy. So what happens if every time you used our product, we just sent you money? Like not quite that ex extreme, but if you're not seeing, you know, for a feature that is obviously going to delight just, just because of the tangible benefits of it, um, if that doesn't, you know, score... Um, on that kind of performance category, then you know something might be wrong with your, with your method. And on the, on the flip side of that, like test with a feature that is just obviously erroneous um, and, and make sure that um, it's, it's you know, being responded to that way. Okay, and then how to actually analyze the results. And there's, there's a lot more depth here that I'm not gonna get into right now. Um, but one thing is, okay, so we have these text-based responses. So how do I really quantify that? Um, uh, and, and so you're not like limited to this kind of categorization scheme. Um, what, what we found works best is if you actually recode your response data set with numerical values, and then you can do kind of a nice continuous analysis where you can see those responses more on a continuum as opposed to like if they fell into this bucket or that bucket. Um, so just as to represent that a little bit, like you could recode any response of I would love it to a value of four, 
and recode a value of I would hate it to a value of negative four and then kind of plot the other responses in between those two. Um, and then you can do, you, you just have more kind of uh, quant tools that you can really use to analyze the data. Okay, um, one thing that can happen when running a Kano survey is your response data is all lumped together. Like we're not seeing any separation, we're not seeing any, any stratification, and therefore, what did we really get out of this? And that happens, it sucks when that happens. Um, so what do you do? And the answers unfortunately aren't super clear. One thing I would say is if you did build segmentation into your sampling, go there first. Look to see, okay, do we see any meaningful differences between users of a certain platform or, or really frequent users versus infrequent users? Um, you can also kind of play around with those coefficients that I talked about. Like if does, does kind of changing the scale help you to sort of, in effect, zoom in on the data and, and start to see more differences? Um, and then sometimes the results are what they are, and when that it happens, you just have to look in the mirror. Like, is it something about the method? Is it our strategy sucks? <laughs> like, what's, what's going on? Um, so, so definitely be prepared for, you're not always gonna get this nice, clean uh, categorization. Sometimes your data is very murky and kind of all muddled together. Okay, so just to wrap up, just a few kind of parting lessons we've learned um, from running Kano studies. The first one is, and this was stated earlier, but it's just know that it's a moving target. People's expectations ch change and shift all the time based on the available technology, based on competition, based on all any number of factors, their experience with your own product. Um, and so these results have a shelf life. Um, and, and, and you can't just assume that because you, you know, got this or that result at one point in time from a Kano study, that those results are just valid onward, you know, for, for in, in perpetuity. Um, also, one, I think one of the biggest flaws of the Kano method is that anytime you're asking people to project what their feelings are gonna be, people are notoriously bad at kind of predicting their future behavior. And so th this method is prone to that, right? Um, what people say they want isn't exactly always what they want. That said, I still think it's worthy as an input, but it just can't be treated as like, this is our exclusive one-stop shop for, for product prioritization. Um, you need to layer on other qualitative methods, other kind of usage data to try to get at what people actually do and then marry it up to the signals that you're getting from a Kano survey, which is reporting on what they're saying. Um, one, one thing that I also don't want to misrepresent is it's not like Kano is this amazing like automatic product roadmap machine where you just like plug in your inputs and then it just spits out your strategy it still requires judgment. All those other factors that we talked about in the, in the beginning are still relevant, are still valid. Um, and so, and, and there's also things that your product team just needs to do that you're not gonna get from, from a Kano study. For instance, has anyone ever had a feature that was kind of mandated from like the, the legal and government or compliance like area? Like sometimes there's things you just have to do. Um, and so, so you have to consider other factors outside of just what you're hearing from your Kano. And then the last one is be humble. Uh, keep your opinion small. Um, at every time like I've run one of these, it's always yielded some surprise. Sometimes it's, it's a really pleasant surprise. Sometimes it's not. It's like, wow, I really thought otherwise. Um, and so, uh, you know, if you think that it, it, and I, I think it also does a good job of instilling that the answers aren't always inside the room. When the prevailing opinion internally is that feature X is gonna, you know, um, uh, you know set the world on fire, but you run a Kano and you find that, hey, that's not really the case. It just kind of has this effect of, okay, well, I guess we need to be a little bit more diligent and also bring in kind of an external point of view as we're planning the future of our product. Thank you. Uh, I would. Uh, um, I don't quite have as much time for Q and A as I wanted, but I would love to hear if there's any any questions out there or comments. 
either about the method itself or just of different approaches for prioritizing product features in general. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, d definitely. Um, and, and even sometimes even asking about the same features in different ways. Um, I, I think there's a, there's a lot of benefit in, um, you know, making sure, like testing the method by kind of testing it in different ways. But, but then also, yeah, spreading responses out across different studies. The trade-off of that is, of course, overhead, right? Like where if you're, if you're paying money for each response, um, you know, you, you have to be efficient with it as well. And then there's also just, you know, the overhead of like the production and executing the survey. But, th but that is a great way to really be more confident in the results you're seeing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad you asked that actually. Um, Testing, <coughs> testing with the features you already have with the users you already have is a, also a great application for, for Kano. There, there's one particular example that, that comes to mind where a study I ran a couple years ago, um, the product had this like rather elaborate kind of reporting feature. My assumption was nobody cares about this thing. It's way overweight for what it needs to do. Let's throw it in the Kano to maybe build the case that we don't need to support it anymore. And the result was not what I expected. People were saying, hey, we, we don't use this that frequently, which is what the analytics suggested, but we expect it to be there um, when we do need it. So, so yes, absolutely test the existing features with the existing users you already have. I think so, but there's this scale problem where if, you, if, if, if you're on a team of where the whole universe is like 50 people, it's probably more efficient to just go talk to a few of them. Um, um, but, and because this, the survey is an efficient way of getting those answers, but it does come with some overhead. Um, so, so yeah, I, I, I think kind of depending on how big the group is, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, and that's where you wanna have your sample population segmented to the extent that you can. Because we, we've seen this actually, so like Jack on our team ran one about a month ago where there were two different types of users who had very different kind of usage and behavior patterns and they responded to the same survey, the same stimuli, pretty dramatically differently. So to the, <coughs> and realizing like, not everyone has the data infrastructure to know what those profile segments are, um, but as, as much as you can, try to really get a granular view of who your user is by building those profile questions or using the segmentation you already have. Yeah, so I, I would say, generally speaking, like up, you know, when planning a new product, in our experience, it's, for, for a new product, it, it's, it's really like, what is the core reason this product needs to exist? And so that's a little bit upstream from this, where this Kano method is just more about the individual features and components that make up that product. So first, I would try to do some, some research on what is the central theory for why the world needs this product. But then when that validation is there, and now we're into that next level of considering what features does it need to have, then yeah, Kano is, is a good method for that. But it's, it's not your first step in a new product. It's more like your second or third. Yeah. Email, like, what 
Yeah. Yeah. So um, if you have, like, if your product has an existing email list, um, that's that's a good way to, to administer it. Um, also, uh, you know, you can, if you have an app or a product and you have the ability to really, like, quickly kind of, like, put like a, a, a next best action or a CTA linking to your survey to put it in the product itself. Um, and then for reaching the outside world, um, there's different consumer research panels where you effectively pay for responses and that can get expensive. Um, and, uh, but, but yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways of, of finding participants. And then in terms of the actual survey delivery, um, there's, we, we just use, you know, web-based, uh, you know, survey tools. So Typeform is our preferred one, but we've also used, um, SurveyMonkey or Pollfish or Qualtrics, um, you know, really any, any, any survey tool, uh, will work. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, and by by weight, do you mean like in the actual calculations of the responses, or just how you interpret those responses? Yeah, like on, on the bar graph, where you get your final yeah. uh, answers from. Um, is, it, is everything like there? Or <coughs> yeah, I've never done it that way. It that's kind of it's a really interesting question. Um, I don't see any reason why you couldn't, but what I would probably, like just kind of projecting what I would do in that scenario, I'd, I would probably just analyze and tabulate the results in the same uniform way for across all the segments, but then just more heuristically, like, okay, we know that this segment is more important because it represents more of our user base or it represents more of our revenue share or like whatever it is, um, and, and then just not pull the math into that. Okay, I probably need to give this room back, but um, but uh, uh, thanks for all the questions and, and thanks for uh, for, for for joining. Uh, this is great. Thanks.